Welcome to First Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, Texas, and welcome to our worship service. And we thank you for tuning in to our broadcast this morning. This is a very special day for us as we share in this, uh, this is the Lord's Day. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And then, of course, another reason that this, that this day is so special is because it's Mother's Day. And we honor the memory of the mothers of our mothers who have passed away. And we remember those and we honor their memory. And then we celebrate all the mothers who are out there listening and watching and participating in this worship service. We celebrate and honor you as the, on this Mother's Day. And then the next thing we want to share with you is that we plan, the plan is now to reopen the church on May the 24th. Is that not exciting? The whole staff is excited about the possibility of our being together once again on May the 24th. So mark that down. We'll be in the gym, and we'll share a lot more things, pertinent information with you a little later. But that's the excitement that we share, want to share with you today. Now, also, the, this is a special day in that we're going to have a, just a portion of our worship service where we celebrate and we pray for America. You, everybody knows the condition that our country's in, and we pray for America. We love America. Dana and I are going to sing this song, America, and we want we want to remind you the words of that song. Some of the words they say, the words say, God shed his grace on us. God shed his grace on America. And that's our prayer. Dana, sing with me.
from sea to shining sea. Good morning. Thank you for watching us today. And as Brother Fred said at the beginning of our service this morning, we are excited about May the 24th. That is our plan. Our plan is to come together again as a congregation on Sunday, May the 24th. Now, just to give me give you a couple of details, we will worship in the gym to maintain the proper social distancing on that day. And there will not be any Bible fellowship groups that morning. It'll just be a worship service. It'll be at 1030, which is our normal time for worship. Also, we will not have children's church on that Sunday morning, nor will there be a nursery on that Sunday morning. And we will stream a service, just like we're doing now. We will stream a service on Sunday morning, May the 24th at 10.30 a.m. But also, on that day, May the 24th, our plan is to be together again as a congregation. You begin praying that'll happen. You begin praying we can get all the pieces together and the plans made, and I'm sure we will. And we will, we will have a wonderful Sunday morning on May the 24th. Now, if you've got your Bible, I want you to open it to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 and find verse 25. And I want to begin reading in Luke chapter 14 and verse 25. Now, large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else... While the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his possessions. Therefore, salt is good, but it, if salt has become tasteless, even if salt has become tasteless, what will it be seasoned with? It is useless, either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. 
He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. But the Pharisees and the scribes begin to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Are you a part of the crowd that follows Jesus? Before you answer that, think about it. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today for the opportunity to share your word. I pray for those listening, watching this morning, Father. I pray that, that you'll speak to them. That they will know that they have heard a word from the Lord when this is over. And that, that, Father, that you'll speak through me. And what I say will be words that you want delivered. And so, Father, just may I become an instrument, a vessel, to share your truth today. To share these important words about what it means to follow Jesus. And so, Father, may, may every person who watches sense your presence, sense your Holy Spirit speaking to them. Fill me with your spirit now, Father. Speak through me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Everyone loves a crowd. The NFL loves a crowd. They track attendance. I checked recently. 16 and a half million people watch a game on television through the, for the NFL. Sixteen and a half million people watch every game on average. And on Sunday night, you watch Sunday night football like I do? On Sunday night, it's even more. Nineteen million people watch Sunday night football. Crowds are important to the NFL. Well, crowds are also important to college football. Personally, I've never had the privilege of being a part of a Texas OU weekend, but I've talked to those people who have gone. And just to be a part of the crowd down there at the Cotton Bowl before the game and then to be in there in the stadium uh, while the game is going on, it is a marvelous experience. Everyone loves a crowd. And, and then I, I also never have had the privilege of being a part of a game down in Aggieland, but I'm told that, boy, you've got to go to Kyle Field and experience the crowd that is there when they all get together and start singing and oh it's just a marvelous experience because crowds are important crowds matter Hollywood movies box office sales are closely tracked we want to know how many people watched how many people came and yes even preachers love crowds when when I was at seminary we didn't have class on Monday because that's all the preachers that preached on Sunday. They gave us a day to drive back to Fort Worth to come to class. So on Tuesday morning, all the preachers would gather in the coffee shop in the seminary. And you know what the question we asked each other was? How many did you have Sunday? How many did you have on Sunday? And I had this buddy. He always asked me that question. How many did you have on Sunday? And I'd tell him a number. That time I was pastoring a church in Euless, and I, I'd tell him, well, we had 87. And he'd say, I had 88. <laughs> or I'd tell him, I, I, had, I had 94. He'd go, I had 95. You see, he always won up to me, or at least he wanted to. Now, I don't think he was telling the truth all the time, but, but he always won up to me. He always wanted to have one more than I did because, yes, crowds are important to preachers. But did you notice in our text today, the person that is not concerned with how many? The person that is not interested in crowds, it's Jesus. Jesus is not interested in crowds. 
Jesus is not interested in a crowd following him. Look again with me at verse 25. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Try to visualize this scene in your mind. Try to imagine this scene in your mind. Great crowds, multitudes of people are following Jesus around. They they are watching him perform miracles. They are hanging on his every word. They are keenly interested in what he is doing. Crowds are following Jesus, and at one point, the verse says there in verse 25 that he turns around. Suddenly, he turns around. He turns around and faces them, and what he says shocks them. It shocks us. Jesus said, what? If anyone comes to me and does not hate His own father and mother and children and brother and sisters, yet even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his possessions. Jesus turns around to that crowd and and says, you can't be my disciple unless you do this. You can't be my disciple unless you do that. Those are the terms, Jesus says. Those are the terms of what it means to be his disciple. Jesus is not interested in crowds. Because crowds have divided loyalties. Jesus uses the word hate. Hate. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers. Yes, even his own life. He, he cannot be my disciple. Hate. Is that, is that what he meant? What Jesus is demanding here is complete devotion. Loyalty so true and so unswerving that even devotion to our families must be subjected to it. Your own family must not stand in the way of your loyalty to Jesus. Your own family must not stand in the way of your devotion to Jesus. Now, fortunately, I have never had to make that choice. Jesus is here pointing out that following him will challenge your loyalties even the closest loyalties you have. And again, I, I'm fortunate. I, I, I've had a family that's always supported me. I, I've had a family that's always encouraged my walk with Christ. But you may not be so fortunate. I, I know and I have talked with some of our students. Some of our students here at First Baptist Church in in Mount Vernon get no encouragement from their family to follow Christ. And sometimes they have to make hard choices. Sometimes there are hard choices that they are faced with. Who are you going to love supremely? Who are you going to be loyal to? Family or Jesus? There is nothing fairer, finer, more beautiful in human life than the love that we have for our mother or father. The love that we have for our wife and children. The love that we have for brothers and sisters. And yet they may challenge your loyalty to your Lord. And when there is a conflict... Between the highest of earthly loves and the call of Christ on your life, we must, as G. Campbell Morgan says, trample across our own hearts to follow the call of Christ. Jesus talks about divided loyalties again down in verse 33. Where he says, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his possessions. 
Jesus is calling for wholehearted devotion. He is calling for all-out loyalty. You must be willing to say goodbye to all your belongings for Jesus' sake. All of your earthly possessions subject to Jesus' love. Subject to your love for Jesus. Let me say that just again. All of your earthly possessions subjected to your love for Jesus. Everything you own, willing to give it up. To stay loyal to Jesus. All the totality of your stuff. At the disposal of Jesus. You see the Reverend John Samus had it right. When he wrote these words that we love to sing. But we never can prove the delights of his love. Until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Did you get that? But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay our possessions, our stuff, at the disposal of Jesus. Yes, my friend, Jesus is, is not interested in crowds because crowds have divided loyalties. Do you know something else about crowds? They are self-centered. Self-centered. And that's why Jesus says what he does in verse 26. You, you, even, you have to hate even your own life. You cannot be my disciple unless you do. And he says in verse 27, you have to carry your own cross and come after me if you want to be my disciple. You cannot be otherwise. You cannot be my disciple unless you carry your own cross and come after me. Yeah, crowds are self Centered. Now, the audience that day knew exactly what Jesus meant when he said that you must carry your own cross. Jesus himself did it. If, if you remember, after being sentenced to death by the Roman government, after being sentenced to crucifixion, they strapped that horizontal piece of the cross on the back of Jesus and, and made him carry it out to the place of execution. Well, Jesus was not the only person that the Roman government did that to. The Roman government crucified, they executed criminals every day. And so through the streets of Jerusalem and out, out to the place of crucifixion there, almost every day in Jerusalem, you would see a man with a horizontal beam strapped to his back. He was carrying his own cross. And everybody knew that when they saw that man with that horizontal beam to the cross strapped to his back, he was a walking dead man. He was dead. He, he was going to the place of execution. That's what it means to carry your own cross. That's what it means when Jesus said that whoever does not carry his own cross, it's come and die. You see, carry your own cross is not some burden that you have to bear. It's not some affliction that you might have or, or, or trouble that you might face. No, the cross is where you die. The cross is where you empty yourself, die to self, and become alive to God. That's what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2. Jesus, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, Jesus emptied himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The cross means... You empty yourself. You die. I like the story of the missionary couple who boarded a plane bound for China. And on the flight, they began to share with a passenger seated next to them 
what they were headed to do. They shared with him that they were headed to China as missionaries. They were going to work with the underground church in China. They were going to work on translating Scripture into the language of the people that they were working with. And the passenger laughed at them. The passenger scoffed and, and, and said, you'll die over there. And the couple replied, sir, we died before we got on the plane. That's it. That's it. Jesus said, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You know what I fear? Sometimes I fear that we have made it too easy to become a Christian. Walk an aisle, fill out a card, let us baptize you. Now your problems are solved because knowing Jesus will make you happy. Now that you become a Christian, your life will be full of good things. Being a Christian is really easy. You just come once a week, you sit and listen to a sermon, you sing a little song, maybe drop a few dollars in the offering plate, and then, buddy, get ready for your blessing. Too often we've, we've made it that way. Being a Christian is the secret to living a good life. That is not what Jesus said. Jesus said, unless you hate your family, you cannot be his disciple. Jesus said, unless you give up everything you own, you cannot be his disciple. Jesus said, unless you die, you cannot be his disciple. Jesus said what? Why would he say that? Because Jesus is not interested in crowds. But he does invite you to be committed. Jesus is not interested in crowds, but he does invite you to be committed to him. Jesus calls us to a life of adventure. Jesus calls us to a life of challenge Jesus invites you to a life of building and battling. Building and battling. Did you notice the two stories that Jesus tells here in these verses? One is about a builder. One is about a battle. One is going to build a tower. Jesus probably is referring to a watchtower for a vineyard where a man would station himself to keep thieves from stealing the grape harvest. One is about a builder. The other one is going to battle against a formidable enemy. Builders and battlers. That's who Jesus is interested in. Builders and battlers. That's what followers of Jesus do. Followers of Jesus build and battle. Do you remember what Jesus said? In Matthew 16, Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's the battle. I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There's the battle. In other words, Jesus, saying, I, Jesus is saying, I am in the world for building and for battling. Who's with me? I am in this world to build my kingdom and to battle an enemy. Who's in? Who wants to come? Who wants to be committed and, and join me? Jesus is saying, I want men and women who will stand by me until the building is done and the battle is won. Jesus is not interested in crowds, but he does invite you to be committed. Someone once said to a college professor, Hey, prof, oh, so-and-so tells me he was one of your students. The professor replied, Well, he may have attended my lectures, but he was not one of my students. Is that all you do? Attend 
Jesus lectures? Is, is, is that all you do? A sermon here? A, a, a worship service there? There are so many in the crowd and so few committed builders and battlers. Maybe the Lord is using this time of COVID-19 to sift His church. Maybe the Lord is using this time where you've been away from gathering. You've been away from gathering with the members of the family of God. Maybe the Lord is using this time to separate the crowd from the committed. I'm asking you today to reevaluate your relationship to Jesus. I'm asking you today to reevaluate where you stand with Jesus. Are you a part of the crowd that follows Jesus? Remember, I asked you that as we began this sermon today. Are you a part of the crowd that follows Jesus? That's the question I ask you. Or are you a part of those who are committed to Him? So that's the question. Are you a part of the crowd that follows Jesus? Or are you committed to Him? I ask that because Jesus comes back again in this text with one more startling statement. It's about salt. And, and, and he says, salt is good. But even if salt has become tasteless, it's useless. When salt becomes tasteless, it's, it's useless. It's thrown out on, on, on the manure pile. And what Jesus is saying that startles me is, is you are of no use to me unless you are committed to becoming what I can make you. You, you are useless to me unless you are like salt. You will never build and you will never battle in the world that I am sending you into, in the culture that I am sending you into. You will never build and you will never battle until you behave like salt. Salt halts corruption. Without salt in the first century, meat would spoil. And so they rubbed salt into meat to keep it from spoiling, to keep it from being corrupted. Are you acting as a preservative of the truths of Scripture? Are you acting as a preserver against the spoilage, the rotting of our culture and our society? How about the world that you live in, in your daily life? Are you speaking against evil? Are you supporting righteous causes? Are, are you bringing the truth of Jesus to bear into the world that you live in every day, whether that be an office, a classroom, a workshop, wherever you are, are you bringing the truth of Jesus to bear into your workplace? Salt, salt halts corruption. Salt also adds flavoring. Have you ever been on a no-salt diet? It's terrible. It's horrible. It's, 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 it's bland. A no-salt diet is, is tasteless. Why? Because salt brings flavor. Do you bring flavor when you walk into a room? Do you bring a little bit of zest, a little bit of spice, a little bit of taste to the world that you live in? Stop being a wet blanket, Christian. Stop being a wet blanket. You are to be the spice. You are to be the flavoring. That's what salt does. Be the life of the party. Jesus was. Every party he attended, he was the life of the party. And then salt possesses curative properties. Christians are the cure. We have the cure for what ails this world. We have answers to questions that people are asking. And so into the world, into your workplace, office, classroom, shop, whatever it is, you bring hope. 
You bring love. You bring joy. You bring all of those things into your sphere of influence. Be salt. Be salt. Stop the corruption. Add some flavor. Be the cure. Because unless you're all that, Jesus says you're useless to him. You're part of the crowd. Jesus is not interested in crowds. But he does invite you to be committed to him. Now, what's fascinating to me are the reactions to what Jesus said. The reactions of the people to what Jesus said. Let me read them again. Jesus has used that phrase that ought to make all of us perk up. He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, I have just said something that you better not just let pass by. You better pay attention to what I've just said. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then Jesus, we, it's recorded for us the reactions to what Jesus said. Chapter 15, verse 1 says, All the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. But all the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble. Begin to grumble that he, th- this man receives sinners and he eats with them. I want to say hallelujah. Hallelujah. No, look here. Look here. The men and women who know their need for a Savior. The men and women who know that they need forgiven of their sins. They are the ones pressing into Jesus. Signing up to be the builders and the battlers. They're the ones pressing into Jesus for him to be king of their lives. They're saying, Jesus, I'll build with you, Jesus. I'll go to battle with you, Jesus. Let me be in your kingdom. While the ones who were quite satisfied with themselves, the ones who were quite satisfied with their standing before God, are not affected at all by what Jesus said. In fact, they are actually repelled by what they see. This man receives sinners and and he eats with them. Those who responded to Jesus' severe message of what it means to be a disciple, those who heard the words that make your heart and my heart tremble were the ones who know they needed Jesus. They were attracted to what they heard. They wanted on the difficult road. They wanted to battle. They wanted to build. On the other hand, the religious crowd that was there was repelled by what they heard and what they saw. Where do you stand in your relationship to Jesus? Where do you stand today in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Are, are, are you a part of the religious crowd or a committed disciple? Jesus is not interested in crowds, but he does invite you to be committed. Do you recall that in Nehemiah, the workers rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, do you recall that they worked with one hand and they held their weapon in the other hand? Those men in Nehemiah's day worked with one hand rebuilding the wall, held their weapons in the other hand because the enemy was near. That is a picture of builders and battlers. Builders and battlers. And that's who Jesus wants to follow him. 
pray with me. Father, thank you today for your word. Thank you today for the challenge, not to be a part of the crowd, but to be one of those committed to Christ. I pray for many to reevaluate their relationship to you through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the challenge today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So what will it be, friend? Builders and battlers. That's who Jesus wants. Who's in? Who's in? You can step across that line and get in today by trusting Christ as your Savior and Lord. Where you're sitting, where you're watching, wherever it is. If in your heart, in your mind, you would repent of your sin. That just simply means acknowledge that you've done things that have broken God's laws. And repent means to change your mind. Change your mind about them. You see them, yes. They violate God's laws and your sin separates you from God. Repent of your sin and believe that Jesus is death on the cross. Forgave your sin, erased your sin, is the means by which you can be forgiven. And then commit your life to Christ. Invite Him into your life to be your Lord and Savior. Your loyalty now belongs to Jesus. He wants you to be a part of His kingdom that He's building, that He's battling for. Would you do that today? I pray you would. I want to thank you for watching our services this morning. Whether you were watching on our Facebook page or whether you were watching on our website, thank you. If you made a decision today to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you made any other spiritual decision today, I would love to hear about it. Please email me. My email address is pepper at fbcmv.com. It's as simple as that. P-E-P-P-E-R, pepper at fbcmv.com. Thank you again for watching our services today. If you have a prayer request, please email me as well. I'll be glad to pray for you. Or if you need any other spiritual counsel, or if you need any other assistance, please let us know here at First Baptist Church. If you don't have a church home, we would love for you to consider First Baptist Church Mount Vernon as your church home. My prayers are with you today, God's best on you every day.